Um, welcome back. Um, it's lovely to be with you. Um, last week was um, a lot of information coming from me to you. This week, I'm hoping to turn the tables a little bit and um, hear a little bit more from from all of you. But um, first, let's begin with prayer. The Lord be with you. Let us pray. Gracious God, for the dawning of this new day, we give you thanks and for its reminder of our daily rising with Christ. Be with us, walk with us as you have promised in this day and open our hearts and minds to the joy and wonder of your love that surrounds us. In Jesus' name, amen. <laughs> um, well, today's session is going to be divided uh, basically into two halves. The first half, i um, going to spend some time uh, hearing you reflect from our time together last week and hopefully hear a little bit about um, your uh, reflections on seeing um, your baptism in a new way in your everyday lives. And then um, the second half of the time, we're going to look at some fonts and um, reflect on how those fonts um, represent the baptismal theology of dying and rising um, that we talked about last week. So that's that's kind of what's on tap for this morning. Um, hey, Paul, Paul, I just want to say hi. Hi, Keith. How are you? Good, how are you? Good. Nice to see you. And tell me about your friend on your left. This is Brent Anderson, our new field ed student from ULS. Yeah, so. Couldn't. Couldn't be going to a better seminary. <laughs> <laughs> nice to meet you. Nice to see you, Keith. Good to see you too. Didn't want to interrupt, but just want to say hi. All right. And thank you, Paul, for getting up right and early for oh, to be with us. Thank you. You're welcome. So um, just to get us on the baptismal page, uh, reading from Romans 6 once again. Do you not know that all of us who have been baptized into Christ Jesus were baptized into his death? Therefore, we have been buried with him by baptism into death, so that just as Christ was raised from the dead by the glory of the Father, so we too might walk in newness of life. For if we have been united with him in a death like his, we will certainly be united with him in a resurrection like his. Um, so the, your homework question for reflection, since uh, we were together last week, was um, how did you see your baptismal dying and rising lived out through your own life in this past week? And um, I'll give you just a moment to organize your thoughts around that by asking a second question, which is just um, uh, in a more general sense, what are the things that you wondered about um, from what we talked about last week? Or what questions do you have um, from, um, from our time together? Um, back in September, we can say. <laughs> so let's deal with those first, and then we'll hear your reflections on uh, your baptismal dying and rising. Any questions of clarification or just um, something you'd like to hear more about or an insight that occurred to you as you were driving on the skook hill? <laughs> yeah. yeah. Well, one thought that I had uh, from last week's that I thought about this past week 
uh, was your statement um, uh, that we are we are born again and again and again and again. Um, and and the reason that struck with me is because way back I don't remember seventies I guess when I my first personal encounter with a evangelical a born again Christian um, and that whole notion of born again and you know I asked uh, the vicar Paul Kiefer at um, Mount Olive well that's a Lutheran stance on this being born again and he said oh yeah we're absolutely born again. And again and again and again. <laughs> and that helps me in daily um, meditations because it's the counter to the frustration one feels when one has that morning meditation and kind of feels like, well, here we here we go again. I I screwed up again. I said I wouldn't, but I did. And of course the words of St. Paul always come to me that that I <laughs> I'll, ma I'll mangle it, but you know what I'm when I'm referring to that what I that I should I don't and what I no, should I, I do I you know I do and and that can be very very frustrating for a person who's trying to be better and do better. At the same time, it, it's I sometimes feel like it's a cop out because well okay I get a free pass so this. Is what <laughs> Uh, there, there's this constant yin and yang, you know, but I think Luther talks about that somewhere. And that's kind of where I'm at, you know, I said, okay, yep, yeah, yep, yeah, this is the same little girl, you know, same song, second verse. You know, sometimes I feel like Groundhog Day, the movie, you know? Right, yeah. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. Well, uh, Dietrich Bonhoeffer, you know, talks about cheap grace, and I, th I think that's what you're bumping up against in your observations. Um, the, the realization for the mature Christian mind that grace is costly um, and not to be um, uh, <laughs> just sort of used as a free pass to use your language. Um, you know, I want to, I want to just comment. Is it Bill? Yes. Yeah. Yeah, I thought so. Uh, I just want to comment, Bill, on on the daily uh, rising, which is so important. Um, but in typical fashion, um, we also tend to neglect the daily dying like what and this is what you're talking about with uh the good that i would i do not um but what it what do we have to let go of what do we have to let die uh in order that christ can raise us up again when we were um really uh robustly into uh, baptismal renewal at Finney Ridge and baptizing several adults every Easter, one of the questions that we asked them to reflect on um, during intense preparation in, in uh, the Lenten season as they prepared to be baptized, most of them by full immersion, um, we asked them to reflect on the question uh, before you go down in the waters of the font, um, what in you needs to die. And um, I, I think that's an important question for all of us to ask, not just at the time of our baptisms, but on a, on a daily basis. Like, what is it that we need to let go of? Be because if we don't reflect on that question, then I think it is easier to get caught up in the good um, that we would we do not <laughs> and the evil that we would not that is exactly what we practice so thanks thanks for taking us there that's a really great baptismal reflection bill how about some of the rest of you Dottie? oh uh, just kind of following up with with uh, bill i've gone down that road many times and i know what i need to give up control hmm. i battle that regularly i am a control freak uh, <clears throat> running to, I 
I have that role in my family. If you ask somebody here on staff that's starting on staff, uh, and not that I'm in your face with it, but I'm always, okay, let's prepare for what's going to happen next rather than just being more joyful in the moment. So each morning I pray for two things. Dear God, let me give up my control and give it to you for whom it belongs. And please rid me of my judgmental mentality. <laughs> They're the things that I pray to give up so I can rise again. Well, thank you for that honesty and vulnerability. A any other reflections of, of another sort uh, from the time we spent together last week? Um, yes, please. Claire, um, I like to think of each morning when I get up as a being a new start. And, and when you're talking about dying at nighttime and waking up in the morning, it, I think it's made me a little bit more appreciative of waking up in the morning and starting over again and being able to think, oh, please let me be a kinder person today, <laughs> a better person today, and, you know, stuff like that. So I, I do like the thought of, you know, waking up each morning with a new start and, and a, a new life. Yeah, it's a little resurrection, isn't it? Yes. <clears throat> uh, that's probably a really good segue into that broader question. Um, what did you observe this week? in terms of um, <clears throat> a, a baptismal dying and rising in your, in your own life? I mean, how, how did you take what we talked about in the classroom onto the street? Okay, I'll go again. Um, I'm, my sister has Alzheimer's and we take turns going and taking care of her. And I find sometimes that I become very impatient with her and, uh, you know, and so I had to keep praying that I'll have more patience with her. And I found this week, I was blessed that I was able to get her onto the beach in the morning and get her feet in the water and give her a nice day. And it was like, I thought about it in the morning. Please let me do better with my sister. Let me be kinder to my sister and don't let me lose my cool with my sister. So it did kind of help me to think of it a little bit more that day that I'm getting up, I'm starting a new day, I'm going to be better with my sister wow that's wonderful yeah thank you um, go ahead Dottie. Mm -hmm. uh, this week i <clears throat> was a very joyful week with me my siblings uh, two brothers and three sisters were in visiting which very rarely can we all be together so one of the things we did was we grew up in the little town called hepper which is close by to here and there is a lutheran church there saint john's lutheran church which is where we all grew up and we were in the sanctuary, which was washing over all of us with a lot of sweet memories and also very sad memories because we buried our parents very young there. We buried three children there, but we also all got married there. And as I was sitting a little bit off from the crowd, <laughs> I started just praying to God to bring all of us the peace that only his love can give and to thank him for the love that we share. I have a unique family and we all like each other. And, <laughs> that is unique. <laughs> and we all just deeply love one another and get along and are there for one another. We're very loyal to each other. Anyway, <clears throat> there with this prayer. And my youngest sister comes over to me and gives me a hug. And I said, oh. And she said, God just talked to me. And I said, what? And she said, he told me how much you love me. There you go. Wow. And I thought, oh my gosh. So of course, in typical Dorothy fashion, I started <laughs> crying like a baby. <laughs> but I thought, thank you God, for raising me once again. And it, I know it, it sounds hokey, but I have a hokey family. <laughs> well, God doesn't usually answer prayers quite that quickly, so I, I there must have been something, something pretty special there. I don't know, and somebody else would say, oh, that's just a coincidence, but in my family we say that it's God, there's no such thing as a coincidence, it's God acting anonymously. So that was anonymous God right there. Yeah. 
Holy Spirit. Yeah, that's a God watch. Any any other um, aha moments or reflections from this past week? <clears throat> I rewrote my sermon last Sunday. Um, <laughs> yeah. After your presentation, I, I, I figured you had a better ending than I did. So, <laughs> sorry about that. we also had a um, had a, a hymn sing memorial for a friend who was um, seventy eight, but she'd had Alzheimer's for a number of years, but always found found consolation in these Methodist and uh, uh, Baptist hymns. We got one hundred and fifty people together. Outside of Reading, and uh, in the pouring rain, oh, yeah. had a memorial service that, if it goes over an hour, I'm I usually check out. But I, I was the host, so I kept it going. I would shorten some of the hymns, but we must have sang fifteen hymns. And wow. the, the Riddler, uh, classmate of mine at seminary, it was uh, Episcopalian in background and felt that every verse of every stanza of every hymn should be sung. <laughs> And then there were readings in between, and then the two hours went very quickly. <laughs> it was good. Yeah, I'd, I'd, I'd really encourage you, um, since, Paul, you brought up the topic of hymnody, I'd really encourage you all to just, just be on the lookout, like put, put a, a radar antenna a little higher, <laughs> um, not only in the baptismal hymns themselves, but in our hymnody in general, um, where where do you see baptism being alluded to in our hymnody in a way that you might otherwise or or previously overlooked? And also, where do you see the themes of dying and rising um, played out in in our hymnody? When I met with Elizabeth and Dottie. Uh, to plan this series, I pointed out to them that in the introduction to the Lutheran Book of Worship, the old green book, the, the big thick green book that preceded the current uh, cranberry colored hymnals that I assume you have in your pews, in the introduction to that, one of the goals of the um, Inter-Lutheran Commission on Worship was to restore baptism to the prominence in our liturgical celebrations that our Lutheran theology implies. And one of the ways they did that was um, with a renewed confession that they suggested be lead, led from the font and with more robust baptismal imagery in um, a funeral service, um, just, just to name a few. Um, but just just be on the uh, on the lookout for that. Um, how how is um, how is baptism being reflected in uh, liturgy and hymns in ways that maybe you didn't notice previously? Um, I see our time is quickly fleeting. I I want to I want to have enough time to look at these fonts and let you um, let you reflect on them a little bit. So I'm gonna. Uh, try to share my screen here and see if we can get this um, right. Um, always takes me a little while, so please bear with me. Yeah, it looks like the Lincoln Memorial, was it? It was. I don't want you crazy now. <laughs> and that's lit up at nighttime in D.C. It gives you chills. So uh, this little presentation begins with this quote uh, from Cyril of Jerusalem, who was a fourth century bishop and theologian. And he says the font is both your grave and your mother. Yeah. Go ahead. Um, so uh, maybe that's helpful to you and seeing that I'm, I'm not making this stuff up. It's, these are just not Paul Hoffmanisms. Um, this this is a really robust part of our theology that goes um, well. I would say goes back to Romans six, and as I talked last week, goes all the way back to the Exodus. Um, but we're we're going to take a look at uh, fonts first that um, 
represent the first half of that quote. And then uh, second, we'll take a look at fonts that represent the second half of that quote. And then I'm gonna introduce you to a, yet another theological concept. Um, just curious, any, um, when you read that quote, what, what were your feelings? What, no pun intended, but what kind of washed over you? <laughs> A uh, mother did, yeah, mother, uh, in a very warm, soothing, uh, life-giving way. Good. Anybody else? Well, I had never thought about the font as my grave, um, so that's what I have to think about. Part well, of let's... the problem is most of them are too small to be a grave. That's true, too. <laughs> yep. Well, let's see if this helps you at all. Holy smokes. Wow. Um, these are some ancient fonts <laughs> um, from the Holy Land that, um, and by the way, I, these are not my own photos. I just pulled these down off, uh, off the internet because I wanted to find examples of, of fonts that um, really represented what we were talking about here. Um, <clears throat> The one in the middle, of course, is the one that's um, best preserved. But before I talk a lot about them, I'm very interested by what you observe. What What do you see there? The cross. The cross. The cross. Yeah. cross. But there's also a, a circle, a hole, like a well, yeah, next to it, which is a different. Yeah. Yeah. Right. And I like that reference to a well. I like that. Yeah. Meaning what, Bill? Well, a well is a, a spring of fresh water. water. I think of like Jesus and the okay. woman at the well um, and living waters. Yeah. I love the living waters imagery. Uh, my guess is, and this is only a guess, but my guess is that the well, as you're referring to it, is uh, where the presider stood, um, which I think is very appropriate then to think of that as a well. <laughs> um, <clears throat> you know, as the presider acts on behalf of Christ to bring the living water to the newly baptized. Um, and isn't it interesting that because these are cruciform, they remind us not only of the grave, and they are deep enough, as you can see, um, to be graves, um, but they also remind us then of um, the horrible death that Christ died um, on our behalf. When I first looked at the center one, thinking about being submerged, that your arms out and going down on your back. It's like you are on the cross. Right. You know? Yeah. Unless you're not submerged that way. But that I had this quick, fast image of me going down with my arms out. Yeah, lovely. Yeah, beautiful. Hmm. Could you tell us where these are from? Uh, these are uh, from uh, Israel. Oh, okay. So these these are really... These are really um, prototypes. Mm. These are the oldest. Let's uh, let's have a look at the next slide. What do you see here? Sarcophagus. <laughs> Definitely. Yeah. 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 Sarcophagus. Yeah. Does everybody know the word sarcophagus? Yep. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Good. Yeah. How about um, what? What else do you see? Lots of artwork. <laughs> Yeah, and what kind of artwork? Well, carving uh, images in the stone. Can't quite tell what it is, but I do see on the one on the upper left, on the very top are crosses. And then it, it looks like figures of people beneath them, I, I guess. I don't know, I can't tell. When I look at that, well, I think of the permanence of the gift. That is not something <clears throat> lightly, figuratively, and and <laughs> literally. Yeah. So um, the, one on the bottom left looks like uh, there's a figure there with snakes all around it. Yeah. What do you make of that? 
Yeah, I didn't yeah. see that. That's good. Yeah, that's yeah. very interesting. Well, it, oh, that's it's, interesting. Yeah. It, it, can you, I? I'm assuming you can see my cursor. Yes. Well, what 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 do we know about snakes? <laughs> well, that's how so Satan appeared to Eve and Adam. Yeah. And your dis and and the worms eat you. When you die, you know. You turn the worms out. Yeah. Oh, it's like that's a bit. Yeah, I this this uh, looking at this and thinking about Eden reminds me of uh, Paul's um, writing in Romans where he says, "As in Adam all die, so in Christ shall all be made alive." So you get um, both grave and mother there. I want to know who these people are. Yeah, they look like they, they look, have their arms yeah, raised and like great. angels from this corner here, like they're. Like, <laughs> I can't oh, see a thing. Angel? Be I can to see it. Are they angels or are they people raising their arms in praise? I don't know. Uh, I I don't know the answer to that. Of course, it's it's kind of a rhetorical question, but it reminds me of. Um, being joined to the communion of saints in our baptism, um, that this isn't, baptism is never a solitary event about a single person, um, but a way in which we are joined to the community of faith. Um, and then what do you see um, in this one? Lamb, mm -hmm. enter, yeah. The orb and cross on top. Those of you who are old enough to remember the red service book and hymnal will remember this symbol oh, yeah. from the front of the service book and hymnal. I'm, I'm giving my age away now. We all remember. You're in <laughs> uh, and I wanted to include this one um, just as a way of illustrating that um, the sarcophagus is not completely an ancient um, way of uh, picturing a baptismal font. This is obviously a much more modern um, font. I was thinking it was more of an ancient one that has a modern, a lid. modern lid on it. <laughs> uh, that, that is possible. That, yes, that is possible. Because the earth looks like it's very earthen. It's earth underneath also. So uh -huh. it looks like it's in an ancient yeah. area, you know, that's maybe been dug up, archaeological site. Yep. <clears throat> okay, I'm going to go to the next one here. Oh yeah. Oh, modern. these. Um, this gets into the mother part of the quote, and how these fonts are much more womb shaped. Um, and I love it that they're all connected to something beyond themselves. Yeah. Mm -hmm. You can't move them. Yeah. <laughs> Pretty permanent. Paul, yeah. this past week I visited my home church. A number of our babies were baptized there uh -huh. before we experienced the diaspora and just moved all over God's kingdom. But um, <clears throat> we are, as you can tell by myself, we talk a lot in my family, and there was sudden silence. Mm -hmm. so we stood around the font and each of us I think were washed with the memory and in light of my experience with you from last week I shared with my siblings eventually you know what was going through my mind and uh, they each said that they had not in their churches heard the emphasis like I was presenting to mm -hmm. them yeah one thank you 
Uh, one of the things I like about this one, um, we'll talk a little bit more in the next slide about its octagonal base, but um, how it just, um, it kind of suggests water that's going to overflow. <laughs> you know, it has, it has the tiled pool there to receive the waters that might um, messily spill over as might happen with uh, water and blood at a birth, right? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I also like that one because it's more uh, pulled out from the wall and it, for me, it feels like it can accommodate the whole family around mm -hmm. and maybe other people in the congregation to be part of the ceremony. Mm -hmm. Yep. Whereas the one on the left, the ones on the far left for us are are really isolated. They're in the corner. <clears throat> yeah. Yeah. I'm curious about the fact that this almost looks like a baptismal font <clears throat> graveyard to me. <laughs> Yeah. which has which has its own theological um interest but this just looks like a place where baptismal fonts went to die um <laughs> because why would you have two and it looks like there might be you know more than two beyond the photo so i'm not quite sure what that's about but yeah. okay we're going to i'm going to introduce you now to a new piece of theology which is um, the eighth day, and I'm, I'm going to read a little bit from uh, 2 Corinthians 5. Um, from now on, therefore, we regard no one from a human point of view, even though we once knew Christ from a human point of view, we know him no longer in that way. For if anyone is in Christ, there is a new creation. Everything old has passed away see everything has become new so there you have the dying and rising everything old has passed away everything has become new the ancients really picked up on this uh, theme of the resurrection on sunday and its relationship to baptism and um of course it was a major shift for Jewish Christians to move from Saturday as their uh, focal day of the week to Sunday as the focal day of the week based on the resurrection. And they came to call um, Sunday and particularly Easter Sunday, the eighth day, um, meaning the first day of the new creation. And um, of course, you can see how baptismally that <laughs> that really worked. So my guess is that most of you have been looking at octagonally shaped baptismal fonts all your life, uh, but not realizing why they were octagons. Exactly. And the reason that they're octagons is um, to espouse and reflect this theology of the eighth day. This is the, the place where you, um, the baptized, become a citizen of the new creation. I was uh, preaching a children's sermon about this one time and uh, asked, um, my wife, who's an elementary school teacher, says never ask a question during a children's sermon because you'll always get an answer you don't want. So <laughs> wise up, buddy. Um, but I did ask, why, why do you think the baptismal um, font has eight sides? And there was silence. And I said, well, what, el what else has eight sides? And uh, somebody said, well, a stop sign. And I said, yes, a stop sign has eight sides. Um, realizing the wisdom of my wife at that point um, <laughs> and saying, well, so why, why do you think, let's ask the question again, why do you think a font has eight sides? And one of the kids said, because that's where sin stops. <laughs> <laughs> and I said, well, that's 
That, that isn't the answer I was going for, but that's pretty good theology. Oh my gosh, <laughs> out of the mouths of babes. Um, so three very distinctive um, architectural periods represented here. This is probably, you know, like the most familiar to you. you you've seen a font like this in a lot of churches. Uh, maybe not with its own spigot right there. And I have sort of mixed feelings about that. I'm not quite sure how I feel about that. No. Um, but, uh, you know, count the sides. There are eight. Um, this one, obviously, you know, German Baroque, uh, very highly stylized and decorated. And then this one um, from a modern um, American Roman Catholic church. Uh, which not only is eight sided, but also um, immersible. I mean, you could easily immerse an adult in that font. My gosh, very fun. Yeah. All right, I'm going to stop my screen share now so I can see your faces better. There we go. Um, so tell me, t tell me what you learned <laughs> from looking at those few pictures. Well, I love the Bible verses that you referenced and brings it home even stronger. And I never knew about the eighth day. Right. Yeah. So I'm taking that out to share with the world. I love that. I love that. Yeah, that's, um, that's a keeper, isn't it? surely is yeah and going back to um going back to looking at our uh hymnals and our other liturgical language um i i think you will find um here and there a scattered reference in hymnody um to the eighth day hmm. yeah. or certainly to the first day of the new creation. Um, and I was, I was preparing to preach on the Emmaus Road text one time, and it's always um, been intriguing to me that the disciples didn't recognize Jesus, and, and why was that? And uh, I got to thinking about this whole first day of the new creation and it occurred to me that um, they weren't prepared to uh, recognize a citizen of the new creation hmm. that they didn't they didn't know what that person what a person from the new creation would look like so uh, you know i don't know i don't know how much historic precedent there is for the interpretation of that text but it really worked for me <laughs> you know uh you don't see what you're not looking for. <laughs> you weren't looking for Jesus, uh, so they didn't see him. And I often think about the uh, the uh, warning that you get to see. Start seeing motorcycles, and, they, and you know, Bucks County. There's a lot of motorcycles and narrow, hilly roads. <clears throat> and more than once, I pulled up to a stop sign, and you know, look left, look right, look left again. I look left, I look right, and then about to pull off, but I look left again. And lo and behold, there's a motorcycle. He was there, but I didn't see him because I wasn't looking for a motorcycle. They weren't looking for Jesus. That's why they didn't see him. Yeah. Well, they certainly weren't looking for a, the first citizen of the new creation, were they? That's for sure. <laughs> and you have that problem today, Paul, I think. Yes. Yeah. Well, I see that our time has quickly sped by. It's almost time for your second service out there. I, I don't want to end our time together without um, expressing to you my deep uh, sense of gratitude for allowing me to come into your lives in this strange technological way and to be with you uh, for the last two weeks. Um, I always learn a great deal when I... Um, lead classes like this um and this has certainly not been um uh 
uh, not been an exception to that. So thank you for so generously sharing your insights and um, God's blessings to all of you in your continuing and ever deepening uh, baptismal journey. Thank you. Thank you. Well, and Paul, we will meet again. Well, we sure will. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Yep. Uh, Take care. Bye bye. I didn't know he had to sit there for this hour. Thank you. <clears throat>